888. Number 888 will be our first song, and if it's convenient for you, you may stand. Song be number sixty six. Number sixty six. Eight hundred and seventy four. Number eight hundred and seventy four. The following song will go to the Heavenly Father in prayer. <clears throat>
before the praying, I just want to uh, extend the greeting from the church down in El Salvador, especially San Miguel, which is the area um, I grew up in the church I, I visit. So they send uh, greetings and encouragement word to everybody here. Uh, so we, they praying for us, and we'll keep praying for them too. And the church is growing uh, down there. It's really amazing the work they're doing over there. Aside the all the situation is going on around the world, um, let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for all the many blessings and everything you, everything you've done for us every minute. Lord, thank you so much for the ability and the opportunity to be in this place to worship you. Lord, help us to every minute that we spend together as a, as a church. We enjoy and, and we learn and we grow up together. Help us, Lord, to grow in unity, that your Holy Spirit guide us and that we learn every, every time that we are one, not because uh, the difference we have is because you make us one. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be uh, in your kingdom. We know that your kingdom you know, is not from this world, and thank you, Lord, for making us part of that. Lord, help us to, every time we praise your name through, through songs, we, we do it with our heart and through heart and spirit. Help us, Lord, to open the scripture, read your scriptures, and, and, and listen to your word, listen to, to the message that you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you offer and give to us. Lord, be with those that are sick. We know the, the illness surround us every day, and we have many brethren that uh, are sick. Please, Lord, be with them, help them, guide the, the medical staff that are taking care of them, and Lord, uh, give them the strength to, to overcome if it's your will. As well, help the family that are with them and, and suffering with them through the illness. Lord, be with them and help us, Lord, as a church to be with them and, and encourage them and help them in many ways or any ways that we can do. Lord, be with us or have lost uh, loved ones. We know the, the passing of a uh, member of the family is always is sad and, and, and brings sorrow to our soul and, and life. But we, Lord, we come to you and ask for to comfort them and comfort the family and comfort everybody that, that suffered the loss. Lord, help us to to be with them and and, and be a companion through those uh, sorrow, the valley that everybody going through. Help us, Lord, to to learn and the Holy Spirit. Is to, be with us all the time and that we enjoy this moment and learn and, and grow together as a congregation and that your Holy Spirit guide us every time. Thank you, Lord, so much for the salvation, for the love and the grace that you show to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be number 752. Number 752. And we'll sing this song to help prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper.
this morning as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. We all know what's coming up this week. This is the week of Thanksgiving. I'm going to mention a few things that have become tradition, it seems like, in Thanksgiving. First would be Black Friday. I don't know where all that started. I, don't, I remember it as a kid that I didn't think there was a Black Friday. I didn't know what that was until like in the 90s. They actually say it started in the, it became norm in the 80s, I believe, but it actually started way back before then. Uh, there's another thing, the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade. That's another big tradition that we have that we've always kept. There is a lot of things, turkey on the day of Thanksgiving. That's a thing that we consider a tradition now. And there's a lot of other things that we can think about. What I like to think about is why we have Thanksgiving. And it's because of 102 people boarding a boat called the Mayflower that left England to pursue a life that they could worship their faith the way that they seen fit. That led to this country being formed and we can still worship today in a world and in this country where we see fit. There's also the thing of Thanksgiving that whenever they gathered to eat the meal, they gave thanks. As we gather today to give thanks to our one and true risen Savior. I want to read a passage from Psalms 100 that mentions Thanksgiving. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So as we celebrate Thanksgiving, let's celebrate the risen Savior right now, as we always do every Sunday morning. But don't just do it on Sunday morning. Do it on Thanksgiving Day. Do it every day throughout the week because it is the greatest thing that we can ever, ever celebrate is the Thanksgiving that we have of knowing that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. Most of all, Lord, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who was willing to sacrifice his body to the cross. As we partake of this bread that represents his body, may we do so in a manner that pleases you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Lord, may we take of this in a manner that pleases you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Song of Invitation. And if you would, please turn with me to page number 732. Number 732 will be our song before the lesson. If it's convenient for you, you may stand. <clears throat>
I guess some of the biggest news we have today is we have a shaved head boy here named Cody Miller. And if you hadn't got to hug him or shake his hand or salute him or whatever you're supposed to do to a freshly minted Marine, you can have that opportunity. But uh, now he is at that phase in his life where he can laugh about all the others that are going through basic training because he has been there, done that, and knows that it's fun after you get through with it. But anyway, we're delighted to have you back. I know your family is as well. Uh, on the Lord's Supper, I, one, one little note before I get started. Years ago, I, there's an Episcopalian church in, in my hometown, and uh, I, they had a sign up Advert, you know, telling when their services were, and they had uh, had the word Eucharist on it. And I thought, what in the world is wrong with those people? And I went home and I looked it up, and it said basically it's communion. And and I'm like, well, why in the world would they call it that? And then I found out that when on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. Guess what the Greek word is for gave thanks? Eucharist. So every time we observe the Lord's Supper, we're observing Eucharist. We're giving thanks. So I just thought I'd throw that in. That has nothing to do with my lesson. Uh, when, I, when I first started preaching, uh, I didn't have a clue how to put together a sermon. Not that I, I'm saying I do now. Uh, I knew I needed help, what, and I did two things. One was I went to every gospel meeting that I could go to and, and would listen to the big-time preachers and, and try to figure out what they were doing. And then I did a whole, lot of, a whole lot of studying, and I would go over to the big church in Pulaski, Tennessee, and I'd go over there, and they had this really nice library, and they had a couple of books there, uh, sermon outline books by Leroy Brownlow, uh, Seeds for the Sower, and I don't remember what the other one was, but anyway, Seeds for the Sower wasn't much help to somebody that didn't know what they're doing because there were sermon outlines with about three sentences and not complete sentences, but that was your sermon starter. But there was another book that by Leroy Brownlow, and it had a sermon in it entitled Nothing. And, and I rem it just it, it, it struck me as just being so odd, a sermon about nothing. And, and I suppose 30 plus years, I know it was 30 plus years, went by, I never never used that, that outline. And then it just, you know, I don't know why that one stuck with me, but it stuck with me all those years. And I decided a few years ago I was going to preach on nothing. And that's, that's what I'm going to do today. Now, if that sounds odd, some of you don't tell me I preach on nothing all the time. That will hurt my feelings. But anyway, uh, it, it does seem kind of odd, doesn't it? So in the beginning, God created everything out of nothing. Now, I tend to want to uh, quote S.M. Lockridge, a little sermon clip that I've shown before in which he says that, that God reached out when there was nowhere to reach and caught something when there was nothing to catch and formed something out of nothing and cast it into the sky and says, stay there, and it did. I'm not chasing this rabbit this morning, although it's a good rabbit to chase, but folks, you know good and well that, that there are people in this world that believe that God had nothing to do with creation. In fact, they just want to dismiss the idea of God. And, and that, to me, is just absolutely ludicrous that people could look at this universe as orderly as it is, as beautiful as it is, as amazing as it is, and, and decide that it came from nothing. Well, it, in a sense, it did come from nothing because God created everything out of nothing, but it all begins with God. 
And we are a little bit intimidated by the fact that some of these people that say that God had nothing to do with creation because there's no such thing as God, we don't need to be intimidated by them because God has chosen the foolish things of this world to make the wise look foolish, hadn't he? And, and those people, and, and I've, I just thought of this, and it's not in my little sermon notes, but I just thought of this, but a, a friend of mine was telling about an evangelist that he knew that, that was just converting people right and left, and, and he went to uh, this guy, he, this doctor that he had converted, uh, said to him, I, I want to learn from you. I, I want to share my faith with, with some other doctors. And he said, just give me some pointers, so the guy did, and, and the doctor wasn't having any success. And, and the, evan- the doctor went back to the evangelist and said, what am I doing wrong? He said, I don't know what you're doing wrong, but let, let, me, let me add them. And the doctor said, no, you, no I'm not sure this will work, because you see, you are not, you're not on their level education-wise. You, you, you tend to be a little coarse and too straightforward. And, and I just, I'm not sure that you can relate to them on an intellectual level. And, and the guy said, well, I'll tell you what, just let me try. And, and the next thing you know, he's converting a bunch of the doctor's friends who, who are doctors. And he goes back, the doctor goes to him and says, how did you do it? How, did, how were you not intimidated by these people? And he said, why would I be intimidated by people that so foolish that they don't believe in Jesus? He said, people that don't believe in Jesus or don't believe in God are some of the stupidest people in the world. I don't care how many degrees they have behind their name. I'm not intimidated by them. You see, it is the foolish people that think the message of the cross is foolishness. The wise people believe it unto salvation. God created everything out of nothing, and without God, there is nothing. Now here's a strange one maybe to some, but belief without baptism equals nothing. I know there are people that disagree with that, but they would agree with the fact that baptism without belief is nothing, right? They would agree. Baptism without belief is nothing. Well, why not? Belief without baptism is nothing. Uh, Years ago, uh, I was studying with this lady, and, and I may have told you this, but it's to me, it's one of the funniest stories I've heard in some respects. I was sitting with this lady, and I said, I want you to read Mark 16, 16. She says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. I said, what does that verse say that you have to do in order to be saved? She says, believe. I said, let's try this again. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, what does this verse say that you need to do in order to be saved? She says, believe. And I said, well, I'm not getting anywhere, but let's try this. He that believeth and goes to the post office shall receive a million dollars. What do you got to do to get your million dollars? She says, you got to believe and go to the post office. I said, now we're on to something. Let's try this one more time. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What do you got to do to be saved? She says, believe. But she just did not want to see that truth, did she? She was refusing to see that truth. It's as simple as that. In fact, I'm not, you've heard me, I'm not a grammarian, and, and I, I don't even try to be, but I do know a little bit about English, and there's a word that's called a conjunction, and a conjunction's job, and a lot of times the word is and, a conjunction's job is to join two words of equal importance. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Belief without baptism equals nothing. Baptism without belief equals nothing. A person who claims to have faith in God, who doesn't act on his his will or his commandments, that religion amounts to nothing. In other words, if you're a do-nothing Christian, your faith amounts to nothing. We all know this passage. There's no point in you even turning there because you've known it. You've known it since you were a little child. Faith without works is dead. If you claim to have faith and you don't do anything to show it, then your faith is worth nothing. 
There are so many people that just say, oh, of course I believe, but they don't do anything to show that they do believe. And our faith should be a faith that is active, and that is living, it's, it's more than talk, it's deeds. And so we need to put our faith into action because faith without works is dead, religion without service is worth nothing. Now a person claiming to be a Christian, a person claiming to be a Christian and not living right is worth nothing to the cause of Christ. Now, just think on that one a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm, probably, I'm probably highlighting or, or focusing too much on, on this one event in my life, but there was a period of time, you, know, you all know this, when I, when I was 15, I quit going to church. M me and my older brother, we quit going to church. Biggest mistake both of us ever made in their lives. But I, I miss the church. I love the church. And, and I don't know, I, I didn't have a legitimate reason to not be going to church. Uh, but I missed it. And I still looked up to people that, that did go to church. And there were two incidents that I remember that, that, I, I'm not, I don't know for sure because it didn't happen. I don't know for sure, but they could have, they could have done a lot of good, and they didn't, on, in getting me back where I needed to be. One of them was actually a relative of mine. We were at a country store, and a young lady pulled up. I was 16 at the time. The young lady pulled up, got out, and she was, she was indecently dressed. And here's this older person that is a family member that's a churchgoer that is, I guess he was trying to be cool, but he made some comments to a person that he should have been inviting back to church about that young lady in which he didn't sound anything like a Christian, but he sounded like a dirty, filthy old man. I still remember that feeling of disappointment in him. I remember hauling hay for a church member. And I actually asked about the church. Here was the time for this person to seize that moment and say, this is what you need to be doing. And he began to mouth off. And, and the longer we hauled hay, the worse his language got. Now, he had that opportunity to do some good, but after he ran down the church and he was a faithful church member and language came out, do you think I was interested in church? I was so disappointed in church because we tend to judge church by individuals in the church, don't we? It's not fair, but that's what we do. Folks, if you claim to have faith in Jesus and your actions don't show that you're striving to be like Jesus, you're absolutely worthless. You're worth nothing to the cause of Christ. Remember what Jesus said, if the salt has lost its savor or its flavor or its preserving power, if the salt has lost, you are the salt of the world, if the salt has lost its saving power, it is good for nothing except to be cast out onto the ground and trampled under the foot of men. Now, I know that I'm talking to good people here. I know that I'm talking to people that love the Lord and, and love others. I know that I'm talking to people here that want very desperately for the church to grow, not for the sake of numbers on the board, but for the sake of souls in heaven. I'm talking to good people. Our example is so important. It may not win anybody over, but if it's a bad example, it'll certainly drive people away. Our, our lifestyle, if it is not 
aim towards pleasing our Lord is worth nothing. And if one claims to have a relationship with God but, that, but lives without truly loving God and loving people, guess what their religion is worth? You know this passage in 1 Corinthians 13 called the love chapter. Listen to what he says. You know it. You do, I don't even have to read it, but I'm going to read it because it is the Scripture, and it's beautiful. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. You know, the Bible is filled with do's and don'ts. And I appreciate anybody that honors those do's and don'ts. But you know, you can do a lot of things, but if love isn't involved, it amounts to nothing. I have dealt with people that knew all the rules and would be glad to point out when you broke one of them. But you'd never sense that there was an ounce of love in their heart. And you know, this sounds so strange. You can keep all the do's and don'ts, not technically you can't, but you can strive to keep all the do's and don'ts because you like rules, not because you love God. If you don't believe that, read a little bit about the Pharisees in Jesus' conversation. To them, it was a whole lot about religion as a show, not as much about a religion in which God is being loved and honored. It was a bunch of people, and not all Pharisees were this way, but it was a bunch of people in that group that loved to be seen as religious, but they didn't have an ounce of love for the people that were struggling in life because Jesus described people as being sheep without a shepherd. They didn't have any leadership because the leadership didn't love. If you have religion and don't have love, you're worth nothing. Now this was a an easy one. What can we take with us when we pass from this life? There's an old mournful song. I don't know if it's in this book or not. I, I, I can remember the first time I heard it, and, and I, I didn't like it then, and I still don't like it, but the message is, is right. It, it, what shall we leave behind? You ever heard that song? It is, it's a true, what it says is true, but it's such a mournful sounding song. What shall we leave behind? I don't know how long the Lord's going to let this world stand. I don't know. I, hadn't, I, I don't figure that out. I hadn't figured that out. Don't know anybody that has except for the Lord. And he hadn't told us. But I know this, and it's not a happy thought, but I know this that if the, the world continues to stand, I'm going to use, to use an Old Testament phrase, I'm going to go the way of all the earth. I'm going to die. As I've told you before, and I make a public plea, my one goal is for my wife not to bury me in Alabama. I don't want to be buried in Alabama. I know I'm going to go first. I know she has the last say because of that. I don't want to be buried in Alabama. I want to rise in Tennessee. I know, I know it doesn't matter where you rise, but I want to rise in Tennessee. But I know this. I know that I am going to leave every, everything I've ever got in the way of material possession. I'm going to leave it behind. Now, I, I try not to be this way, and I fuss at Leanne about it, but I'm guilty of it. I, I'm a sentimental person. I like to keep all kinds of stuff. Consequently, we have an extra house to supply, to store our stuff. And if we were to have a yard sale, nobody would buy the stuff in our little house. I like, I like stuff. I, li I love stuff that's sentimental. 
I don't want to get rid of it. You know how much of that I'm going to leave behind? Everything. Was it Louis Pasteur that when he died, wanted his hands on the outside of the casket, at least while he was, I think it was Louis Pasteur, because he wanted everybody to know, he had his hands like this, that's what it was, he had his hands like this, to, to let everybody know that he was taking nothing with him. That's what you're going to take with you. All the stuff you treasure so much, you're not going to take it with you. You're going, you're going to leave it behind. It. Quote that song. But I, I tell you something that I want to do. This is personal. I, I, I want to pay for my own funeral. I don't want land to have to go do a GoFundMe when I know I'm going to die. I don't like that stuff. I want to pay for my own funeral, and I want to have saved something to help my kids out and my grandkids. Y'all understand that a little bit? You want to be able to leave your family something besides debt. Now, that's a goal of mine. But I tell you something else that I want to leave. I want to leave them with the knowledge that I'm in Jesus. I want them to stand by my grave, not happy that I'm gone, not happy over the fact that I've given left them behind something. I want them to leave my grave site or my jar on the shelf or whatever it happens to be. I want them to know that I left this world serving the Lord. Now, you're going to leave everything behind. You ought to leave a spiritual legacy like that. That'll do your family more good than money will. Promise. Now, one more question. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. It's not going to profit him a bit. If you gain the whole world, which you're not going to, Satan will promise you a big chunk of it, but he never does deliver. But if you gain the whole world and lost your soul, you have profited nothing. And that's a, that's, that's a statement. I'm serious, folks. I'm not being melodramatic or overdramatic. That is a statement that ought to be on our hearts every day we live. What shall it profit us if we gain the whole world and lost our soul? Now, I'm closing with one of my all-time favorite sermon illustrations. I'd give credit to whoever I got it from, but I have no clue. There was no preacher that was trying his hardest to, to connect with the audience and to glorify the Lord and, and to have people actually feeling something. And he preaches for 45 minutes and he realizes that he has not connected, that he has not moved people like he wanted to move people. And by the way, the Holy Spirit has something to do that as well as the heart of the recipient. But anyway, at the end of 45 minutes, he says, ladies and gentlemen, nobody has listened today like I want them to listen, so I'm going to preach my entire sermon all over again. He says, here goes. Christian, Christ, I-A-N. Without Christ, I am nothing. Isn't that a good definition of Christian? Without Christ, I am nothing. If any person glories, let him glory in the Lord. We are Christians, children of the King, the Most High God. Let's celebrate that, and if you're not a Christian, why don't you do something about it today as we stand and sing together?
preaching, I kind of, I kind of have a, my adrenaline stop, even though you may not still have adrenaline while I'm preaching. But it, it, sometimes it's just like I go into a, a day, and, and sometimes people respond that I've known my whole life, and, and I can't get, get the, the, I can't call the name to save my life. And, and when Rachel came up this morning, I'm like, well, at least I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I don't think I have, but I, I remember what the name was. <laughs> and that's an embarrassing thing when I, when I, when I know we've even traded goats. So, I mean, we're, 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 we're kinsmen for sure. But anyway, that, that little moment is embarrassing. But anyway, Rachel comes forward today, and, and she says she and I are a whole lot alike when, when this is all done, that she wants to disappear because she doesn't know what to do with the attention, and I, I certainly can relate to that. But our sister comes forward and she says, uh, just everything spoke to her today in the service, the songs, the prayers, everything, and uh, she just wants to get back to basics. And, and trust me, it, she's a good lady, and I know you, we know that we're blessed to have her and her husband and the children here, and we appreciate them and, and the good people that they are and the good that they do. She just wants our prayer, and so let's, let's offer it up for her. Father God, we're grateful for our sister Rachel. Uh, we're so grateful that she is with us. We're so grateful that she has been blessed with a good husband and some wonderful children. We're grateful that, that they're healthy and, and, and are blessed in so many different ways. Father, we're grateful for her example this morning, even though she, she doesn't like the attention and doesn't desire it at all, she does want to be a stronger Christian, and so she has shown tremendous courage, and, and Father, we just pray that you bless her for having that courage and blessing her with that courage, and, help, and we're so grateful that she wants just to get back to the basics and, and serve you and love you in an even greater and more effective way thankful for her honesty and openness this morning. And we just pray to bless you. We know that you forgive her because you love her. You gave your son for her. She has accepted your son. And it is through his name that we pray. Amen. 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 Just a handful of announcements before we have our closing prayer this morning. I'm uh, going to start out, invite everybody back out this evening. We're going to be starting back up season two of The Chosen. Um, surprise, surprise, Dad said it's his favorite episode yet. Um, so you got to make sure you don't miss it. But he did say if you want to go home this afternoon and do a little bit of research before you come back. Um, let's see. John chapter four is going to be that section of scripture if you would like to go home and read before you come back John chapter 4 um, he says that it's going to be covering quite a bit as far as visual aids is concerned the parable of the lost sheep the parable of the Good Samaritan and the nicknames for the Apostles James and John's the sons of thunder so anyways just invite everybody back out for that um, 
a few announcements uh, that I have that were handed to me also. Um, want to keep in your thoughts and prayers, uh, Lane and Joe, two brothers, both of them, ha one had um, open heart surgery and the other one had um, some injuries due to a fire. Um, so just be thinking of, um, of both of them and through what they're dealing with right now. Um, we're collecting uh, hats, gloves, and scarves for the giveaway. We started that back up. There is a tote back here in the back hallway if you'd like to grab a bundle of those and put those in the tote. The, the youth will go out and they'll deliver those away. Um, so just be thinking about that the next time you go the, to the store. If anybody wants to participate in the Christmas parade, there's a sign-up sheet as well in the back hallway on the bulletin board. So if you'd like to jump on the bandwagon, so to speak, uh, with, with the Christmas parade coming up this, this two weeks away, maybe? I mean, it's pretty close. All right. Um, our Thanksgiving service, since this week is Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving service will be on Tuesday. We will have everybody stay in here. It's still going to be the regular time as Wednesday night service, but we will not have Wednesday night service. It will be moved to Tuesday. There will not be classes. So like I said, everybody will stay in here. Uh, so please come out for that. Um, the last announcement that I have on here is just, just be mindful for Mary Dean Pettigo for her family, um, the passing of her on Monday. The visitation and the funeral will be here at the building. The visitation is this Saturday from 1 to 8, and then Sunday from 12 to 2, and the funeral will be Sunday afternoon at 2. So again, that's visitation here at the building, Saturday 1 to 8, and then Sunday 12 to 2 with the funeral following at 2 o'clock. Is there any other announcements before we dismiss? Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I just looked up and connected with Lena Joe. You're absolutely right. Is there anything else? All right. If not, would you bow your heads with me then? Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the time to be able to gather together, to be able to celebrate and praise your name. We thank you so much for um, thinking of Josue coming back from from his home congregation, we have brothers and sisters spread out throughout the whole world, and we just pray for safety and success and growth in all of those congregations with all of our brothers and sisters that are connected throughout. Lord, we thank you so much for this congregation and for the people in it. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Rachel Sigfrig and for her family and for what she did this morning. And what she says is something that I feel as well is just so important to connect back to those basics, to those fundamentals. And it's something that we need to think about every time as we do come to church. And connecting to Randy's lesson as we go out and we talk with other people, we need to take every advantage that we have to be able to spread your word, to be able to be that good example, to, to see those opportunities, just to mention having a church family, being a Christian, and being able to put that little spark there in someone's heart that could potentially be lit. Uh, and we thank you so much for, for bringing Cody back for uh, his new title, for his new haircut. We thank you for his future that he has. And uh, in a month's time, as he heads back out for more training, we just pray continually for him, for success and for safety and for his future. And for the example, knowing uh, that he was excited to be here this morning, that he will be Excited to see his brothers and sisters again um, and be able to spread your word as well to other people. Uh, we just have so many people in this congregation. We thank you so much for it. And with that being said, we do just continually pray that you are preparing a preacher for this congregation to be able to come in, to be able to lead, to guide, prepare us as well, that we will be very earnest to step up to the plate, to work and to be ready to move when there is a chance to move. We just pray for the elders and for the deacons every time they gather together and they go over applicants and they go over people who have uh, tried out here through, through sermons. We just pray so much for your help upon them, their minds, their hearts, that they take into account. Um, it's not a small responsibility. It is a large responsibility. And they realize that, and we just pray for them. Um, we pray for all of those that are sick, those that have lost loved ones. We pray so much for the Lawson family and pray so much for the Pettigo family. Um, just pray that you help them in the way that you know that they need, that you give them comfort and that we as well will be there to hug and to shake hands and to provide whatever we can as well. Um, 
Lord, we pray for those in the congregation that are expecting as well, uh, those that have just had babies here recently. It's just, it's such a wonderful congregation, I say again. We just thank you so much for the people here. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for the forgiveness that you give to us so richly and so freely when we are so undeserving of it. Uh, we just pray that as we leave here today, you keep us safe, return us back here this evening, and provide us through a good week with the Thanksgiving week. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray.